And uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Corey, and I'm the president here of the Lidditz Historical Foundation. And tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about early Native Americans of the Lidditz area. And uh, of course, we're focusing on Lidditz and Warwick Township here in Lancaster County. Many of our towns and all around our region uh, have Native Americans, and Lidditz is no exception. So uh, once again, um, if if uh, you have any questions, you can use the chat box feature at the bottom at the end of the program. If anyone uh, joins us midway through, I will admit them. And also a reminder yeah. that this program is being recorded and will be available on YouTube tomorrow in case you uh, missed it. And at this time, if you haven't already, or if I haven't already, uh, please mute, mute your microphone. That way everyone can hear me speak. And uh, let's let's get right into it now. I just want to talk a little bit about tonight's agenda. First of all, we're going to talk about who they were, what kind of Native Americans uh, were present here in the Lidditz and Warwick Township area. Where did they live? Okay, we know they lived in the Warwick Township and Lidditz area, but where exactly did they live? How they survived? Of course, this was... Uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years before cell phones, before electricity, before the internet. Uh, how did they survive? And uh, next uh, talking point, notable persons. There are several notable notable characters within this story uh, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, next uh, talking point is going to be lasting legacies. And then, of course, as promised, the last section of the program will be a Q&A. Uh, for anyone to ask questions. And I imagine the entire program will last anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes or so. Okay, so let's jump right into it here. And uh, let me just, uh, let me just, oops, sorry about that. Let me just, okay, go to the next screen. So we're going to start with probably the most widely known Native Americans not just in Pennsylvania, not just in Lancaster County, but of course the Lidditz area. And those are the Susquehannocks. Um, they're also known uh, by uh, the Conestogas, by Penn's early settlers. And uh, these were the same uh, members of the tribe that were, it's a famous story. They were encountered by, Cap encountered by Captain John Smith of Jamestown when he explored the northern reaches of the Chesapeake Bay as early as 16, about 1608 or so. Uh, now, what's interesting about the Susquehannocks is that they were described as being giant in size. And if you know anything about the Susquehannocks, you know that to be true. They were described as giants in size. But the kind of the, the, the irony there, the twist there is, as uh, further research kind of went on and the years went on, we learned that they were maybe just a little bit taller than the average human is today. But people back then, now again, this is the early 1600s, people back then were a lot shorter. So by today's standards, the Susquehannocks weren't giant in size, uh, as, as some people might believe them to be. They weren't eight foot, nine foot, 10 foot tall. Um, they were probably only a few inches or maybe six inches taller than the average man. Okay, so that's interesting to uh, to note. And by 1763, this tribe was reduced to about 20 all across the county. And uh, it's kind of a shame. Uh, someone has a chat question here. Yes, okay, you can hear me. All right, good. Uh, that's kind of a shame, but they were... Uh, uh, probably the biggest tribe known around Lancaster County at the time. And again, by 1763, so, uh, you know, less than 75 years, they were down to 20 in the entire county. All right, now I'm going to go to the next slide here. The second most widely known Indian tribe, at least in the Lidditz area, were the Nanticokes, uh, who had a sizable encampment here around the Lidditz Wolver Township area. And they were also the very last tribe to be seen along what's called the Lidditz Creek or the Lidditz Run. Uh, the source of the Lidditz Creek, um, I'll talk about this later, is the head end of the Lidditz Springs Park, otherwise known as the Lidditz Springs. 
And uh, like I said, we'll talk about that later, but that's where the nanocokes were widely seen. Uh, and uh, that's where they more or less uh, camped. Uh, interesting here, just a side note, Indian Town Mennonite Church, which is uh, right up the road from us in Clay, is actually built on land which was once inhabited by the Nanticokes. So the Nanticokes were not just in the Lidditz area, they were all around the county, including Clay Township, Cacalico Township, uh, all around the county. Now, this is an interesting infographic we have here. Uh, if if you know anything about Lidditz, you'll uh, recognize these streets right away. This is a bird's eye view of the Lidditz Square. You've got the Lidditz Springs Park there in the middle towards the left and Lincoln Avenue and Cedar Street and Main Street and on and on and on. Well, those dotted red lines that you see are actually uh, ancient Native American Indian trails that we are aware of throughout Lidditz, okay? So you can see they, they went north and south, they went east and west, and um, they occupy, what we just talked about, they occupied space near uh, and, and along the Lidditz Springs Park, uh, the Lidditz Run, um, just on and on and on. So these were known local Native American trails in downtown Lidditz. Uh, Main Street is a very, very old street. Um, and um, Main Street that we know it as today is over 10,000 years old. So there's no surprise that that was a Native American trail. So where did they live exactly? Well, we know some of the Nanticokes also lived in an area or an encampment, which is now uh, three, around 301, 301 West Orange Street at the location, excuse me, location of Warwick High School. Uh, another trail ran along the Lidditz Creek to the Conestoga River. Now, of course, it was no surprise that a lot of these encampments were situated along bodies of water or you know, streams. They could bathe, they could cook. Uh, so uh, that, that that is no surprise that they lived near water. Still another encampment was at the edge of Warwick Township uh, along near what is now Oregon. If you're familiar with Oregon Dairy, the supermarket, uh, right around that area that's considered Oregon. And that was another highly populated Indian encampment. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but it's worth repeating. They did live along water sources, in dugouts, in huts, in longhouses. Uh, these areas also offered game. Now, of course, not only did the Native Americans use the water, but game like deer and rabbits and pheasants would go to these streams to drink water and they could be easily hunted by the Native Americans. This is interesting. Um, this is a drawing from the 1960s by the former president of the Lidditz Historical Foundation. His name was Hiram Eberly. And uh, there was a location in downtown Lidditz behind what is now the Pilger House Apartments, which um, the Stone Foundation is still there. Uh, it's an earlier structure from the 1700s. But at one time, believe it or not, there was a large natural spring behind the Pilger House. So I have an arrow here on the left. If you can see my cursor here, um, of course, this is a drawing. Uh, this would be the stone structure, which where which was originally situated where the Pilger House is now. Okay, just to kind of give you some some uh, uh, kind of direction here. Uh, behind here, behind the Pilger House, was a spring house there. And there at one time was a natural spring that led into the Lidditz Run. This would be North Lane, the alley there that runs behind Pilger House now. That's still there. Of course, we talked about that. But there was a big spring that originated underground uh, at some point behind the Pilger House and ran and joined up with the Lidditz Springs Creek. Okay. Uh, various tribes used this spot for a campsite. We know they camped there behind the Pilger House and, of course, a meeting place. Uh, today, there's no evidence left of that spring whatsoever. If you walk back North Alley or North Lane uh, and looked 
there's a parking garage there that was recently put in maybe not quite 20 years ago behind the Pilger house. Uh, that building has been renovated. The, so the stone portion is gone. Uh, the stone foundation is still there. It's now brick. But my point here is there is no evidence at all of a a the the bit the, what was called the big spring back there. What happened to it? I don't know. Um, but at some point, uh, it just kind of ceased to exist. Okay. Now another place where the Native Americans lived, and again it goes back to you know beautiful water source. They camped and lived along the head end of the Lidditz Springs. Why? Well, again, there was game there, an abundance of fish, fresh, clear spring water. Uh, and at that time, uh, when the Native Americans occupied that, that area, uh, the head end of the spring was called the, Bing, the Big Spring Head. Okay, uh, So not to be confused with the Big Spring that we just talked about here, but the Big Spring Head, okay? So continuing on, uh, you have to remember too that uh, this is an early photo from the late 1800s, but you, you have to go back about another 7,500 years uh, when the Native Americans occupied this location, uh, location and um, it was murky, it was marshy, it was swampy, uh, it was had to be accessed by canoe. So just picture that today uh, during the Lidditz 4th of July celebration here in 2024, people canoeing up and down the Lidditz uh, run there, the Lidditz Springs. Uh, but that's how they got from one section of the springs, you know, way down the road, maybe at the Pilger House, maybe further east, down to the spring head. And again, why was that? Well, certainly they some of them walked it. But like I said, it was marshy, it was swampy, and it was just more navigable by canoe. Uh, we know the Susquehannocks meant there. They had many meetings there. And how do we know that? Well, there are many stone spearheads that were found and excavated out of the Lidditz Springs Park um, maybe 50, 75 years ago during uh, a renovation. This is interesting. This is a quote I found. An early community member stated, there lived an, on Owl Hill an old man, D Daddy Hun, who remembered going as a small boy to the spring to fetch home a horse that his father bought from the Indians living there. That was 1730. So we know at least until 1730, the uh, Native Americans, uh, the Susquehannocks, were, were sort of um, living in this area. Now, another place where they lived is called the Indian Woods. Uh, this is just north of downtown. There's a map here on the left to kind of give you some perspective. Um, the San, Do San Domingo Creek is here. The Marathon Convenience Store, there's Seacon Electronics. Up uh, another quarter mile north is Rock Lidditz. Um, so right where this tree line is here, let's focus more on the left side of the screen where this arrow points, this is known as the Indian Woods. And uh, it extended almost into Mannheim uh, to the Northwest. Um, most likely that area was inhabited by Nanakokes. So you have Nanakokes primarily occupying this, this uh, area uh, known as the Indian Woods and the Susquehannocks primarily inhabiting the Lidditz Springs. Did they have a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, meetings together? Did they have a lot of uh, things that they did together? Probably. Were they enemies? No. Were they best friends? Probably not. They probably kept to themselves uh, each tribe. But again, this is the Indian Woods. And that tree line is still there today. Again, the, the small stream uh, runs through it called the Santo Domingo Creek. A little bit more about the Indian Woods. Uh, present Arrowhead Drive nearby is a lasting sign of what was once occupied by the Nanakokes. Many places around Lidditz and around other you know, cities and towns all across the United States, there is evidence of what was once there. Uh, for example, uh, here, Arrowhead Drive, 
I understand a lot of Arrowhead points were recovered all around Arrowhead Drive and all around that development. That is just a stone's throw from this Indian woods. It just, it just makes perfect sense. Now, let's talk a little bit about some notable uh, Native Americans, specifically to Lidditz. Maybe some of these names you might recognize, other names might be um, you know, completely new to you. And out of the hundreds of tribes uh, members that uh, lived around Lidditz or were indigenous to Lidditz, here are some of the more, the more famous ones. And I picked uh, what I feel are, are probably the most uh, popular, the most influential, I guess, if you will. The first one was a lady named Martha. Uh, we don't know her real name. Uh, certainly, uh, Martha was an English name. We do know she was born in Chickamauga, New York, about 1737. And she was a Mohican. She was not a Susquehannock. She was not a Nanakoke. Uh, and she was not from the Linnets area, so she was a Mohican. So did other tribes uh, or members of tribes live here? Absolutely. Now, Martha spent most of her life in another Moravian town, Bethlehem, uh, but she did spend some time in Linnets, which I'll get to. While living around the Bethlehem Nazareth area, uh, as you can see on your screen, she was hidden in 1763 uh, in Nazareth uh, from the Paxton boys, which uh, I think probably many of you know that story. They murdered many of the Conestoga Indians. They trapped them in the old Lancaster City Jail, which is now the Fulton Opera House. Uh, and it was a really horrible massacre. And during that time, uh, these Paxton boys were um, hunting Native Americans left and right. And uh, the good citizens of our county uh, and beyond would hide as many of these uh, indigenous Americans as possible, with Martha being no exception. So her life was spared from that uh, terrible massacre. Martha eventually arrives in Lidditz in 1771. Now, she was baptized Moravian, which is why she was living in Bethlehem. Again, Bethlehem's another uh, very popular Moravian town founded by Zinzendorf, as Lidditz was. And um, two years later, once she was settled in, she began teaching in the day school. Now, I have here the day school. What the day school was, was the girls' school, what we know now as Linden Hall School for Girls, okay? One of the oldest continuously operating schools in the nation. Now, an interesting thing happened in 1775. The attendance of the school, um, the girls' school, dropped to anywhere between, we don't know exactly, but we think it was around four to six students. And uh, Martha became the sole teacher of that institution, teaching those, you know, that handful of young girls. So, you know, when you hear that Lidditz is, uh, excuse me, that Linden Hall is one of the oldest girls' schools in the nation. You can thank Martha for uh, keeping that school going. As far as I know, that school continues, you know, today, obviously, but it, I don't think that chain was ever broken, even though there was a small handful of, um, of students. Martha kept that school going as the sole teacher uh, around 1775. And by the way, this, this went on for a couple months. Uh, she never married. She eventually dies in 1783 and is buried in God's Acre uh, portion of Lidditz Moravian Cemetery. Now, all of these people I'm going to be talking about tonight, you can't, some with permission, uh, you can go out and see where they are buried. They're all around the Lidditz area. Uh, but um, this is Martha's grave here again in God's Acre, which if you don't know what God's Acre is, it's the older portion of the Moravian Cemetery behind the Lidditz Moravian Church. In that older section, it's again in God's Acre, uh, all the stones lay flat. And the reason for that is because uh, the Moravians felt that in God's eyes, everyone is equal in death. So uh, you can consult a map 
Um, I don't have on here, unfortunately, where in the cemetery she's built, she's buried, but you can easily find that online if you want to visit Martha and pay your respects. Now, the next person I want to talk about is actually two people, Michael and Mary. Now, again, these are their English names. We don't have their tribal names. And Michael and Mary were the very last two recorded Native Americans of Lancaster County. Now, remember when I talked about the, the Paxton Boy Massacre in 1763? Uh, Michael and Mary, same thing. They were trying to track down as many uh, <clears throat> Native Americans as they could. And Michael and Mary, like, like Martha and so many others, were hidden. Uh, in this case, Michael and Mary were hidden uh, in the basement under a false uh, floor of the Hershey family, which is now sort of near the Kreider Farm property between Lidditz and Mannheim. And uh, originally, Michael, excuse, yeah, Michael and Mary were residents of what's called Conestoga Indian Town near Millersville. So that's where they probably lived uh, their early, the early part of their lives. The Paxton boys were coming. They were scooped up and then uh, hidden in, uh, you know, in the Hershey farm between Lidditz and Mannheim. This here on the right is a picture of the Hershey farm, the, the, the family farm, which still stands today. And um, more information about Michael and Mary is to the left. They were also part of the Lenape tribe. And I said they lived on the property. Well, once the Paxton Boy Massacre kind of ended, um, Michael and Mary did not move back to the Millersville area. They actually stayed there um, on the property of the Hershey family. And they lived in a hut behind the Hershey farm. Guess where? Guess where? You guessed it. Next to a stream. Why? Again, perfect water source. Eventually, they passed away, Michael and Mary did, and they're buried near the stream. The grave had two headstones and two footstones to uh, mark their burial site, but no real marker, no, no real uh, cemetery marker like we know today with a person's name, the year they were born, uh, and the year they died. Um, and their actual burial place was sort of lost through time for many, many years, but the gentleman here on the right, his name is Arthur Young. Uh, Lancaster newspapers did a series of articles and interviews on him uh, because in 2016, he got permission to enter the property and beautify the site of Michael and Mary. And I'll show you some pictures of that here in a minute. So he cleared away brush. He cleared away bramble. He found the two footstones. He found the two headstones. And he erected a, a giant, beautifully painted butterfly at the site. Now, this is uh, not a butterfly like we would picture it. This is a Native American symbol for a butterfly, which, which we'll see. Uh, and that many times when, when they were buried, you would see these um, illustrations created near Native American graves of butterflies. And the reason for that, it's a symbol of... I guess you would say transformation going from one life to another. Uh, today, the site is beautiful. It's still being maintained. I'm not sure if Arthur Young himself is uh, has a hand in that. Uh, again, I know the Kreider Farm, you know, from Kreider Dairies, uh, is in charge of. Oh well, owns the property, and I somebody's out there mowing the grass. I was out there about a year ago uh, with permission. And uh, it's it still looks very beautiful. Uh, here is the um, butterfly that I mentioned here on the right hand side. It's pretty big. It's really elaborate, and um, it is on private property. And uh, you may visit this site of uh, Michael and Mary, their final resting place. But please contact Crater Farms. Get permission. Uh, parking is kind of uh, strange the way you have to do it. You have to drive back the lane near the fa old farmhouse that I showed you. Um, so please, if you want to visit the site, uh, call Kreider Farms and, uh, you know, just, just get permission beforehand. Okay, moving on. 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Here, one last picture. This is a close-up color view of the two headstones and the two footstones. Uh, and uh, that's that. If you if you're standing in front of it, there, uh, the, I actually took this picture about a year ago. If, if if I'm standing there taking the picture directly behind me is the butterfly illustration that we talked about. But yeah, there are the head uh, headstones and there are the footstones of Michael and Mary. And you see they're connected there with some lumber. Okay, so uh, another person I'm going to be talking about today uh, was a Native American Eskimo. And yes, certain Eskimos are considered Native Americans. His name was Ephraim Alexander, and there's a picture of him there on the left. So you know, if I have a photograph of somebody, it's got to be past at least 1865, because um, you know, when during the time when Native Americans inhabited our area, obviously that was long before photography. There are no photos of Michael and Mary. Uh, there are no photos of Martha. Just the sketch that I showed, but we do have a picture of Ephraim Alexander. And uh, like so many other the neighbor, Native Americans, uh, that was his English name. We are not 100% sure of his real name. We do know, however, that he was born in Carmel, Alaska in 1883. And while living in Alaska, he worked as an interpreter and as a fisherman. Eventually, he was uh, brought to America by a gentleman named Reverend Samuel Rock, who was an Alaskan Moravian mission missionary. Uh, Mr. Rock uh, probably was doing some missionary work in Alaska. He meets Ephraim Alexander. He converts him. He convinces him to, you know, bring him back to America. Alexander then enters the Carlisle Indian School. You can Google that, uh, the Carlisle Indian School in 1902. And uh, the plan was for Ephraim to, uh, while living, you know, in Carlisle and in the school, he was going to be here for five years and he was going to learn to be a carpenter. Now, Ephraim became sick in 1904 during an outing after only two years of him uh, being in the United States. And you see that I have outing in quotes there. Well, what was an outing? An outing is what you refer to as meant he was out working, laboring. He might have been farming. We don't know exactly, um, but uh, he was out in the field or on the farm, and he became very, very sick. He became uh, even sicker, and uh, Reverend Rock, who I just mentioned, took him in to care for him uh, in his home in Lidditz. The sickness lingered for months, and uh, sadly, Ephraim dies um, in 1905 in August at only age 22 years old. Uh, because he was converted, if, if you remember, I said he was converted. Uh, he is buried in Lidditz Moravian Cemetery. And as you can tell by the flat stone there, he is buried in God's Acre. You can see there, I'm going to use my little um, cursor here if I can get it to work. Whoops. Uh, native of Alaska, died August 11th, 1905. Uh, we knew that he was 22 years old, but they never could confirm his birthday. And uh, the bottom here says, neither shall there be any more pain. So the, the sickness lingered. And like I said, he died young, 22 years old. Now, if you know anything about uh, this story about Ephraim Alexander, uh, you can Google it. Um, there was several major news articles that came out within the past couple of years about tracking down these uh, indigenous people that were sent here from their native country to America to the Carlisle Indian School. Um, I'm not going to get into all the specifics of that. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, suffice it to say, if you read those articles, if you if you Google Ephraim Alexander Carlisle Indian School, uh, there's been controversy in recent years 
concerning uh, the bringing of these natives, you know, back then, the early 1900s, the late 1800s, bringing these natives to warmer climates far, far away from their homeland. Now, remember, Reverend Rock met Ephraim Alexander in Alaska. He converted him. He somehow convinced Ephraim to move to America to attend the Carlisle School. And, um, and of course, Ephraim got very, very sick then. And we know the rest of the story. There's his obituary there on the left. But the controversy, like I said, has been in recent years uh, about how horrible of a, of a thing that was to, to do at the time um, to, to bring these, you know, the, to yank these, these natives away from their countries. Now, the last portion of our program, I'm going to be talking about some artifacts and some other things around town, or as I like to call, a lasting legacy. Now, this is a really neat uh, example of a stonehead axe, and this is pretty much um, actual size. This was donated to us, when I say us, I mean the Lidditz Historical Foundation, about uh, four or five months ago, this came in, a, a gentleman came in with this, and this was recovered east of what is now Bonfield Elementary School uh, during the 1960s. And uh, a gentleman named Lester Bachman was digging a hole for a clothespin line in his backyard, and uh, he, he recovered that <clears throat> right near Bonfield Elementary. Now, uh, Lester Bachman has since passed away. His son actually brought, brought that into us. But um, it's been in the family possession since the 1960s. Um, so that is a clear, great example of a stonehead axe. Now, if you know where Bonfield Ele Elementary School is, what is that near? It is near, um, the, the, there's a stream right near there. Kind of if you think about where the start of the Warwick Rail Trail is, uh, not what, not even a block away, makes perfect sense. Um, that an artifact such as this would be found near the stream. Other arrowheads and points like the one seen on the right have been discovered all over the Lidditz area. We know of several that I mentioned earlier about being recovered from the Lidditz Springs Park. Um, many years ago, a hobby for young kids and adults was arrowhead hunting. Uh, when a farmer would, um, you know, turn the soil with, with his mules or with a modern tractor. Um, you know, I've heard tales about kids going into the field, the farmer's field, and, and, and seeing what they can find, seeing what might turn up in the soil. Um, arrowhead hunting isn't so much of a thing anymore uh, because of, you know, stricter trespassing laws and people not always knowing their neighbor and just things have changed in the world in the past 50, 60 years. So arrowhead hunting isn't necessarily what it once was during the 19, you know, thirties, forties, what have you. Um, of course, the question now lingers, my last point there on the bottom, uh, are there more artifacts still yet to be found? I, I am absolutely certain there is. Uh, if you want to arrowhead hunt, uh, you know, around the Lidditz area or wherever you live, you know, please get permission from your neighbor if he's a farmer or Amish or whatever, especially if it's near a stream. Um, you never know what you might find. And that is the end of my program. And uh, let me see if I can now open it up to questions here. If I can... Uh, Get that to work. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Um, if you do, I would suggest putting them in the chat box, if you could, if anyone has any questions. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Well, it doesn't look like anyone has any questions, which is fine. Uh, if you think of something, send us an email to info at lidditzhistoricalfoundation.com, and uh, I'll be happy to try to answer your question. Um, and uh, with that, I want to thank all of you for participating in tonight's lecture. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned something. 
And most of all, thank you for supporting local history. Have a great night.